we have been doing a solid series and solid each letter in the word solid builds an acronym that stands for some object oriented programming principles that I think uh, are widely accepted as maybe some good uh, practices when using object oriented languages like Java or C sharp and, and others too, just because um, the language you're in uh, may not have all of the the same exact type safety features of those two languages. They're the two that come to mind as kind of being similar enough to use the same principles. Some of these principles still apply. I mean, even if you're in any language, when we were talking single responsibility, that's probably a good practice, no matter what language you're in, as long as it has procedures or functions and, and modules of some sort, keeping what you do in each of those modules is limited to one thing as, or as much as possible is probably going to help you later when you're trying to find what happened to that code you were working on. So tonight we're going to talk about the dependency inversion principle, which we may multiple times tonight confuse with the depend with dependency injection, a different, a technique that you can use when you're programming. You might, and you might we'll talk about it. it. I'm not going to confuse it. Yeah, I have. I have confused it. <laughs> Everybody does. It's it's pretty common. You're, I mean, you're totally right. A lot of people actually, um, you know, like it's even in an interview question, how many times do you say what, do you know what the D stands for? And people say, oh, dependency injection. You know, it's a, it's a common response and they're certainly related to each other. So it's kind of understandable that people would mix them up, you know. Yeah. So, so I'm looking forward to it. This, this entire series uh, Andy Schwamm has put together slides, samples, explain the principles. And generally what I do is say, okay, Andy, how, how do I use this at work? And, and boy, I'm having a hard time understanding this. So I'm happy to fill in that role again in just a little bit. But for right now, why don't we turn it over to you, Andy? And thanks for all the hard work you've done on this series. This has been pretty cool. I can't wait to wrap it up here with dependency inversion. Yeah, thanks. Um, I uh, Yeah, we're kind of at the end of this thing, right? I mean, there's no prerequisite. If you, if you missed the earlier episodes where we talk about S, O, L, and I, no no worries, right? Um, these They stand alone. I mean, I think they these, these principles complement each other. Um, and yeah, I do have some samples. I whipped up some samples today to show you guys, um, and I hope... This works out pretty well. Uh, I kind of threw some of it together, but let me um, share my screen here and see. Yep. Okay. So uh, I have this slide deck and, you know, we've used this slide deck before. This is actually an old slide deck of mine. It talks about design principles. Um, and, you know, we went, actually went through some of this when we started off solid, right? Um, I, I feel like we always have this responsibility to do a, a, a quick like sort of disclaimer about design principles, which is to say that um, you should use design principles if, if you need them, if they're helping you solve a problem, right? So we're going to, we're, and we're talking about these solid principles, which I, th I think are kind of widely accepted. Uh, and Chris said that, right? They're, they're pretty widely accepted, I think, and, and people really use them a lot. However, they're maybe not perfect for every scenario. And so just because we talk about um, the dependency inversion principle here doesn't necessarily mean you should use it. You should use it if it helps you solve problems that you have. Um, and so, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, why we need them and all that. But let's let's get down to the dependency inversion principle. And I'm not going to run these slides in like slide mode. It's just something to put on the screen here while we talk about the dependency inversion principle, which is one of the solid principles. Um, actually, should we, should I repeat what they are? You know, we have single responsibility. We have, uh, and that, you know, we have open, closed, Liskov substitution, interface segregation. And the last one is the D, the dependency inversion. Um, do you guys think I should like, should we do a one sentence on each one of them or are we cool with just moving on? What do you guys think? I, I think it's been a while since we've done the show. It might be good to do a quick recap. Okay, I'll try to put them into like simplistic terms and give like a, you know, what's the elevator pitch, whatever, for a single responsibility principle. This is the one that says, you know, keep your keep your classes small, keep your modules small. 
a class should have only one reason to change. And a common way of translating that is, you know, kind of like a class or a method should really only do one thing. Uh, to get into the, the slight differences between that would, would take a while. So, um, you know, I don't want to get into too much detail. Open closed principle is about um, making your code extensible, right? You want to think about um, people shouldn't have to get in and change the guts of your code in order to enhance your code or to enhance your application. So classes should be extensible. And it goes into some ways that we can make classes extensible. Uh, Liskov's substitution principle is really reminding us that um, we should be able to substitute a, a class, um, a, a derived class for a base class without really um, having to worry about it. Like it should, it should, it should behave nicely, right? Again, I'm trying to kind of kind of go quickly through these interface segregation principle. So it's like the speed round, right, guys? It's like, quick, 30 seconds, what are the solid principles? Interface segregation principle says that we should keep our interfaces small and not force our clients to, like, implement this whole thing when they only need one method on the interface. And we can, we can, um, we should separate those and keep them clean, right? And last, that brings us to good old dependency inversion principle. How was that for the speed round? Quite speedy. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. You win. Too... You win a copy of our home game. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, awesome. So, um, all right. So what is the dependency inversion principle? The dependency inversion principle, I will read from it here, says high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules. Both should depend, upon, depend on abstractions. Right? Abstraction should not depend on detail. Details should depend on abstractions. And this is the big, this is the big thing here. We want to we want to take our dependencies on abstractions and not depend on concrete implementations. So, um, and th there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, imagine, uh, you know, I, I don't know from a talking point here, I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, I'll show some examples in the code. I've got some code samples. Maybe we should sort of jump in and take a look at that. Um, sometimes I think the code is the best way to explain what the principle is. But keep in mind, we're talking about, this is about really decoupling code, right? That we shouldn't have um, a class that needs a lot of dependencies on the details of what it wants to get done. It could take a dependency on maybe a contract or an interface and things like that. Let's show, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, I've got good old Visual Studio open. Oh, wrong screen. So I've got Visual Studio open. I'm using demo mode, by the way, guys, huh? Demo mode? Demo mode is back. Demo yeah, mode is back. I just remembered to turn mode. it on like right before the show. I was kind of proud of myself. I'm like, yeah, good job, Andy, right? Um, and thanks, Meg. I, I saw don't know nice what demo mode before. is. What is it? What is demo mode? Oh, demo mode is an extension that uh, I think is an extension. I think we said well, you have to have an extension. And what it does is it allows you to configure your fonts so that it's like your sort of demo version, right? I've got the, you can hopefully tell a little bit that I've got the font bumped up even in the solution explorer. And if we look at some code, let's take a look at some code here. Uh, whoop. There we go. Uh, my font is pretty big on the code, but even the um, like the hover is a little larger than it would be. And maybe we need to tweak those settings, but it's kind of cool that you can go to demo mode. And then when I'm done with a demo, I can I can return my menus like in one click down to down to. You OK, know. so is it like a quick theme switcher, just a really fast theme switcher? I guess we can no. call it that. What was it from? Do you remember? I thought we talked about it as the extension. I'm trying to remember. I'm just looking to see what extension I have installed now. Oh, I, th I mean, I think it's great that somebody built, you know, something like because because I know that what I often do in Visual Studio is I do go I, I go into the uh, the the tools options and change the fonts and everything. But then you're kind of stuck with it. Right. And yeah. And if there's if there's a quick like, hey, this will let me just switch back and forth real easily, then I think that's fantastic because, um, you know, I I do I do bump up some font sizes in Visual Studio and that's that's forget demo mode. That's just that's yeah. uh, that's just because I can't see Sego Segoe UI <laughs> nine yeah. anymore. 
Yeah, I see actually in the chat, Meg's asking, you know, can you change font uh, colors and stuff? Well, what you can change in here is like anything. I, I shouldn't say anything. I don't know what it covers. But if I go into here yeah. and change oh, uh, anything I change in here, the code, uh, the font that I'm using, I can change like this visible white space. Okay, I don't even know what that one is. I can change the size and the color. I can change the bookmark. I can change all these things. Thing. I think anything I change in here, um, uh, I think uh, I can change settings for like the output window, right? If I wanted to change the size and color of the output window and all those things, everything will get remembered. It's really like, it's really a profile switcher, right? I think is what Chris said. And um, it, it makes it really kind of easy. Matter of fact, you even it even resets, I think, like your the menu, like your recent files and stuff like that. So only the things you're doing when you're in demos, your extensions get reset to zero and you have to re-add your extensions and things like that. It's a really nice way to reset uh, your environment. Um, and I wish I could remember how to set it up. Uh, I was kind of hoping you guys would remember. That's okay. <laughs> you know what? I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, to throw you off track there. I just figured that we were praising demo mode I'd like to see what it is, and then maybe at least now folks in the audience use Visual Studio who've never even heard, right? Now they know. Yeah, like, well, it's yep. not called, sorry, I'm it's not called demo, demo mode. It's called presentation mode right here, right? Oh, okay. Uh, and it, okay. it says demo up here. When you use it, it says demo, so I feel like I'm in demo mode. But it's that same presentation mode, you know, that we've, um, I thought we, I, 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 I don't know, maybe I confused you when I said demo mode. Um but anyway, that's not the point of this show, right? Um, yeah. I don't know what... Okay, this... Sorry, but I didn't mean to to take that much of a detour, but thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. So yeah, let's talk about it. Dependency inversion. We've got a... Yeah. And we're in C-sharp tonight, but something we'll get to later, and I did mention this a little bit at the top, is wow, some of the solid principles definitely fit much better in languages like C-sharp and Java. Um there are articles out there on the dependency inversion principle in JavaScript and in Ruby, and we're going to share those a little bit later. At least I'll have them in my But I want to make it clear that, like, if you're watching this and you say, hey, I don't really do C Sharp, maybe I should, maybe it's not for me. I think a lot of these principles are still going to apply. So, I think so. I try to use these principles yeah. on, um, on other languages. You know, like whatever I'm using, you maybe can't go to the extent that you can with an object-oriented language but yeah I try to I try to take these concepts and use them wherever but so let's kind of go back if we in the, or one of the earlier demos we did this demo of single responsibility right and we had this class that had and this method called join where you could join uh, the website as long as you provided a username and a password and it would do all this stuff right it would validate the user and it would add the user and send a message it did like all the code and then what we said is we wanted to show single responsibility. So we showed how you could then take it, abstract or sorry, extract out the methods and sort of move them into other classes. For, for brevity's sake, I have them all in one file here. But we've got this validate user method on a membership validator. We've got this add mem method on a membership service, right? I've taken all these things out and I've got myself down to this really nice view of what we would call single responsibility. That each one of these things does only what they're supposed to do, right? They only do one thing. Um, and then this, this join method does one thing. Its job is to sort of orchestrate or direct traffic for all these other little single responsibility things. Uh, and that's you know a little example of the single responsibility principle. The problem here now is I've got these uh, strongly, you know, strongly coupled uh, dependencies. Matter of fact, I'm newing up these objects in here. I'm saying I want a new membership validator. I want a new membership server service, right? And what I'm now depending on is I'm depending on an implementation. I'm not depending on an abstraction. Okay, does that make sense? And why why is it bad to depend on an abstraction? Well, think about this. You know, if I want to compile this code, and let's say I want to I want to ship this thing out or whatever, and, um, and I'm compiling it. Well, maybe this membership service, which adds the user to the database, maybe it takes a hard dependency on the entity framework. Okay, maybe the message formatter has um, a hard dependency. Like maybe it gets a document 
uh, from the file system on Windows. Okay, and it's going to format the message off the text file or something like that. I don't know what it does, right? Maybe the notifier has a dependency on SMTP mail. Okay, that means when I compile this this uh, this project here, this solution, I have to take all those dependencies, right? I can't then share this out. What if we want to run this? Uh, I and I tried to make up this example here again. This is a little bit made up, a little contrived here. But if I'm taking this dependency on a Windows file system, then I can't really run this thing on a non-Windows system, right? Or you know. Imagine those kind of things. We, maybe you're not going to use Entity Framework. You don't want to have to carry that dependency along. And remember, when I compile this, I would have to have that dependency coming along. You know, we have to compile it with that um, with that uh, reference in there. And so, so we want to get back to abstractions. Abstractions also makes it easier to think about, like unit testing, uh, and it makes it easier to swap things out. We might want to have. Uh, multiple types of membership validators, right? Maybe we have like, uh, you're trying to become a, an administrator as your account type. Maybe I want to have an, an administrator validator or something like that. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why I want to have these abstractions in there. So how would we get about doing that? Uh, and we could take a look at what we would really want to do is we would want to basically um, create these all. So I guess I have a different project here. I have a couple different uh, projects in the solution. The first thing we'll start off by doing is let's make a bunch of interfaces, right? Here's the membership data service. Here's the membership validator. These are really simple. Remember, this is demoware. This isn't like the real thing. And, and you, you normally might have more complex interfaces here. But I've got these four things in an interface, right? And that interface is in its own project here. So now, my projects here, by the way, this dependency inversion, this is the old stuff. This was just what I was showing in the beginning. Then I've got right. interfaces. I've got this application logic, right? So application logic, I just called it that. Think of this as this is my app. This is where the, where the, where the, where the stuff happens, right? So here's my membership service. And my membership service only needs to take a dependency on this membership validator. I'm sorry, this I membership validator. It only needs to take a dependency on this interface's uh, DLL, right? Um, and so therefore, whatever the concrete implementation of this, remember I said, well, what if the membership validator, you know, has a dependence, uh, sorry, maybe the data, data service has a dependency on entity framework, right? Well, the interface doesn't. This does not have any other dependencies. So again, when I go into my application logic, here, is all the code I have. Well, not all the code I have, but this is this is the, the extent of my dependency. It's just based on this interface. Do you see how that would be like lighter weight and, and more decoupled? Well, if for some reason the rules of the membership validator changed, or like you were saying earlier, <clears throat> maybe next time it's to validate something totally different, like an administrator or something. Exactly. As long as right. as long as that new class implements the i membership validator interface right which you defined as having a, a validate user method then we can use it and this code doesn't change at all we just have right. to find a way to get it to to take that class instead of uh you know the one it was using previously yeah yeah exactly right and um you know in, in my research on this though it's interesting how i i tend to focus on what you were talking about but what I hear when I do the research on this, especially like when you go back to demos, you know, like Uncle Bob, who, who really made this stuff popular, regardless of what you think about Uncle Bob, you know, he made this stuff popular. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he talks so much about, you know, the, the compilation aspect of this thing, right? The fact that these are different projects. And so if I want to take and use this, um, this same model in a totally different project, Right, I can use this, and again, I'm I'm not carrying those heavy dependencies along with me, on entity framework, you know, or whatever it is. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Now, of course, I have implementations for these things. Right, here's uh, I have this project called implementations. This uh, you know, and it, this gets compiled separately. And here's my membership data service. What does it do? It implements the I membership data service. And of course, I'm I'm not really implementing at all, but. <laughs> But the point is, 
you know, this isn't a presentation on, uh, this isn't a talk about how to build a membership data service, right? So we want to focus right, on right. this, uh, the fact that we're using this abstraction. So here's my code in my application logic. I write this code. Everything's great. Here's my join method. It doesn't look all that different than my um, single responsibility version, right? Here's the, uh, I can, you know, copy this code in here. What the heck? Let's, let's see how different it is. Um, this is it here. Uh, let's see, you know, whoop. oh, it looks like I missed a letter here when I copied and pasted it, but, um, no big deal there. Um, right. So validate user, add format message, send notification, right? It's, it's the same thing, right? However, it's decoupled now. Uh, and I don't have the new keyword in there. And I always, there's a, there's a catchphrase someone, I, I heard someone say lately, uh, oh, new is glue. New is glue, as I think I think the phrase or something like that. Um, new new can be your enemy, and we don't want to new these things up. So, in an, in a nutshell, this is the dependency inversion principle. I am depending yeah. on an abstraction. Okay. Now, from there, we can talk about two other things, right? And or we could take a break here and have a conversation. But the two other things I want to talk about are DI, right? Not DIP, dependency inversion principle, but DI, which is dependency injection, which is the next logical step here, by the way, because you may be wondering, where do these things come from, right? So there's yeah. dependency Well, I think we injection. got a good question. What's I think that? we got a good question about okay. when you just said new is glue. I think we got a good question. Why? Why new is glue? Well, um, because it rhymes. I mean, <laughs> isn't that enough, Meg? Uh, you know, I mean, like, um, so the answer, new is glue, is because, uh, sorry, the answer to why that's bad is because it locks you in. It locks you in to that dependency, right? When I new it up over here, uh, in this example, I don't have a chance to swap this out for anything else. It's hard to deal with for unit testing. It's hard to deal with, you know, for the example we talked about, where I might want to configure it uh, at various times to use a different validator. Um, and, and again, I've locked myself in on dependency and all the dependencies of my dependency, right? And that, that chain that we don't want to, that we don't want to build. So uh, just yeah. to, could, could you say it another way that this class and this method, so we have a class, the single responsibility class, yep. and it has a method, the join method, because it, it says in the join method, new, make me a new membership validator, that now this method in this class cannot use anything other than a membership validator without having to change this code. Well, that's, that's, that's great. That's a great uh, example. And that, that would tie it back to something like the, um, the open-close principle, right? I have to now come in here and, and rip this thing up if I want to sw swap it out. Um, that's good. Yeah, that that's um uh, I've heard it said as well that if you see the new keyword that that's your hint that you are breaking the dependency inversion principle. And I want to be fair for a second because I know what I what I thought the first time somebody said that is the first place my brain went was well then where am I supposed to new things up? Right. And I don't necessarily think that we have to answer that question right this second, because I think you're leading us there, Andy. Mm -hmm. But but I want to at least let the audience members know that it's OK if that's the next thing on your mind. Totally. Is, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying it's like you're saying new is bad and I can never use it. And it's like, well, no, that's not true. But what we are saying is that new is glue so that now join the method that Andy has been showing us. It's it's locked in. It has to use that membership validator, that membership service, that message formatter, and that notifier. If you're coming from something like JavaScript or Ruby, you could I could still see like, hey, I'm still a little confused. And I and like I said, I've got a couple blog posts we can look at later that might help clear that up. But if you're a C sharp or Java vet with strong typing and and interfaces, which both languages have, it might be more. It might be something where you look at it and say, like, oh, yeah, I would have to create a whole new class to to uh, to 
and, and not only would I have to create a whole new, if, if I create, I'm sorry, let me start that over. If I created a whole new class to validate something, I can't use it here in join easily because this one's locked into a membership right. validator, right. not the administrator validator or the whatever you were talking about earlier. Yeah. And, there's and another, I know sometimes, there's another phrase that we yeah. hear a lot and people might be wondering, you know, what I hear that a lot. What is it? You know, tightly coupled. Okay. These two, uh, these two classes are now tightly coupled. Um, because of this new keyword. In this other example, which I think is this one, we're now loosely coupled because we're, we're relying on the interface, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and that's, a, that's an important thing to do is to, is to rely on the interface, yeah. right? Um, right. So Unfortunately, what doesn't always come through in samples, I think, is, is if, let's take a quick peek at your interfaces. And for a second, I'll take a quick detour and just think like an interface, right? In our cars, or in, if, if, you, if you're driving a car, the gas pedal, can, and I'm not a car guy, so excuse me when I get this totally backwards. The gas pedal is your interface to like the transmission. I can, I can put in a different transmission. I can design a car with continuously variable <laughs> transmission instead of the classic like gear shift transmission, if that's even what you call it. But I still use a gas pedal. And the only reason I can say that is my Nissan Altima has a continuously variable transmission. It does not go, it doesn't do that. But I still use the gas pedal. That hasn't changed. And it doesn't matter which car I get in, I'm going to use the gas pedal. So my membership data services ad method is the gas pedal. No matter what date, what I want to do to, to look up, to add a member, to add somebody to a membership, I'm going to call add, pass in a username, and pass in a password. It doesn't matter what kind of membership it is and how many types of membership data services Andy writes. My code doesn't care. And, but what's missing in this example, I think, is, the, is one of the, the dangers of not following this principle is if if you start passing in classes that have other public methods or maybe even public properties, what if I start dotting into them and start taking dependencies on them and then you want to change how it works? You can't because I'm locked into using your concrete membership data class service and I'm going to just go ahead and dot into the username and find out what the third letter is in it and if you left it public. I know, Andy, you would never do that. You would put it in a private backing field. But by defining an interface, you're basically, it's making you as the developer say, okay, I gotta think of all the controls that I've gotta put on this vehicle for the person to drive it. And then I can change how the rest of it works, but those controls are, are gonna be in place and, and I don't have to worry about that person <clears throat> using something that I didn't intend them to. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, your analogy might be a little skewed. Uh, I was thinking, you know, the gas pedal is, it's okay. Well, I'm not a car guy, right? But when I push the gas pedal in my Nissan, the car goes. That same transmission functions as to whether I push it in another car, which yeah. changes gears. Yeah, the car goes. <laughs> That's great. But the point, your, your point is right. I mean, I'm laughing a little bit, but sure. Um, that's the whole idea behind being able to, you know, um, behind, you know, there's a contract and it only, it only requires a very limited amount of things that you need to know. Right. And after that, it can do whatever it wants to do with it. You know, um, like, like in your case, the gas pot, maybe the gas pedal has a parameter. That parameter is, uh, how much pressure are you putting on the pedal? Right. You know, or like a numerical value between zero and a and hundred. Right. And, and the engine and the transmission and all those things work together to, to figure out, um, you know, I have a, I have an electric car, right? You have a gas powered car, but both of them have that gas pedal. The interface is the same, right? Um, they both take that same sort of information and give it to something that, that does something totally different with it. Right. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's the idea behind the, uh, you know, sort of, uh, dependency inversion principle, like that kind of stuff as well. Um, so, yeah, so I, so I was, I was saying, um, there's, there's two other things that sort of follow up DIP dependency inversion principle. 
Then there's dependency injection. And then there's IOC, which stands for inversion of control, right? So we got DIP, DI, and IOC. And um, <laughs> Rich, an African or a European? I don't know. <laughs> I just yeah, saw I don't your, know that one. Just saw your comment. Love that. Love that joke. So let's um, let's take a look at dependency injection. Dependency injection is something that, quite frankly, I remember when I first learned about dependency injection, and I was a younger developer, and I remember people saying like, "You got to use dependency injection. You got to use uh, IOC." As a matter of fact, you know, along with it, an inversion of control. And I remember thinking to myself like, "I don't know. I'm just a." I, I don't know if I'm like up for that. Like that stuff sounds complicated. And once I learned what dependency injection is and saw it, I was like, oh, that's dependency injection? You know, like some people might even be doing it and not even know that's what it's called, okay? So the idea with dependency injection is if I go to my membership service, right? Here's Here are those interfaces that I'm depending on, right? These are private level uh, class level variables in my case, right? There's a few different ways to do dependency injection, but here's the injection. I'm using the constructor and I'm taking the validator in my constructor. I'm taking the membership data service. I'm taking the, oh, oh, I remember that. I was, I was screwing around with this and I, I, I thought I removed this. That's funny. Um, I didn't catch that earlier. I'm taking my formatter. I'm taking my notifier, I'm taking all my dependencies, and what am I doing? I'm injecting them into the constructor, okay? And then I'm simply just copying those over into a, into a way that I can reuse those later in my class, right? Dropping them into these, into these uh, private fields. Um, and now, that's dependency injection. I've just injected them into my constructor. Um, there are other models of dependency injection that are less popular. There is method level injection. There is property level injection, right? Those are three different ways to do dependency injection. There might be others that I don't know about. Um, property level injection would be if I had something like, uh, um, I'll just copy this thing down here and say, you know, I turn this thing into a property, right? And then something, again, it doesn't, we're not talking about the how, we're just talking about the, well, we're, we're not talking about where the, where the dependency is fulfilled. But I could call this setter, right? You can imagine that. I could call this setter and inject this membership validator into here and then use it as well. It's less commonly used these days, uh, as is um, method level. You know, you could do the same kind of thing. I could, guess I could inject in my my uh, I membership, let's see if I'm, you know, I could guess I can inject in my membership validator in here as well. And there, there are ways to do that, right? We're not going to focus right. on those ways right. because generally speaking, when, oh, I put a semi, yeah. Uh, generally speaking, when you hear people talk about dependency injection, they are generally speaking about constructor injection. Um, and, and, you know, there's more to come after that, but you could sort of end the conversation about dependency injection right there. That is the dependency injection. Right, right. So uh, the reason why that's especially important, you know, for uh, for .NET Core slash .NET 5 developers is because built into ASP.NET Core. Well, now you're changing the topic. Hang on. Uh, well, now I'm not trying to. <laughs> I'm not trying to change it. I'm just saying there's built-in dependency injection. Well, so that that is that is important to to understand dependency injection, which isn't the same thing as dependency inversion. Right? Yeah, but really, I I think what's really built into I could be wrong. I think what's really built into .NET Core ASP.NET Core in particular is IOC, inversion of control, right? Uh, at, which is a mechanism for providing the dependencies that you want to inject, right? Um, they use dependency injection throughout the ASP.NET uh, Core framework. They use it, but the cool thing that's built in is the IOC provider that comes along with um, .NET Core. At least that, that's, 
I, I don't mean to just like say you're wrong. Like, that's just no, my interpretation. I, I, I of, see you what know. you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And, what, and I think it answers the, the question I posed earlier when I spoke for for maybe the chat or how I felt when I first when I first sat in on a solid talk or heard this discussed. The first place my brain went was, OK, so you're telling me I can't new things up here. Where am I supposed to do it? Right. Well, let me let me and show I you how that works. Brand, Be before I yeah, show you how right. that works, I do feel like it's important to, to add a caveat to this whole concept of that you can't use the new keyword. Because let's just say, and I don't have a class, but let's just say I have public class person um, or user. Let's call this user, right? Um, and user has... Um, Right. Um, let's do this real quick just to just to prove a point here. Um, OK, so let's just say that for some reason in here, I need this user object instead of one of these things. Right. There's nothing wrong with saying um, uh, user u equals new user. Right. And then maybe I need to, uh, you know, say like username equals uh, username, right? I, I, I can do that if I want to, right? Um, that's newing up like, you know, a small, like a class that you use for, um, for as part of your application. It's an important thing, but it's not really like a dependency, right? We're not taking a dependency on user. I mean, I, 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 maybe you could argue that you are, but it's not the same circumstance. Does that make sense? I think there's a trade-off, right? There's a trade-off to not newing up something right here because, for example, we use strings all the time. We're not going to dependency. In, we're not going to inject <laughs> that. Right. Hey, this class, you know, this particular class or method might use something other than a string right. next time, and you're like, no, it won't. Come on. Right. right. So <laughs> I suppose there is a judgment call to be made which is uh, this particular class, this particular method is always going to operate on that user. That's its job. So that judgment call, I guess, is, uh, is part of what you get good at. Is that right? Or am I leading, did I go away from your point? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's as much a judgment. I mean, so there's a gray area in here somewhere, right? There always is. Um, and you're right, there are judgment calls that get made. This to me is just part of standard, you know, when I do this stuff, it's, it's okay to do this new user. Now, could, uh, uh, let's give it a different example. Let's just say I have, um, I have this thing called a user converter, right? And I say, uh, you know, convert, and its job is to take username and password, right? And the thing that it spits out is a user, right? That's another way of doing it. You could say, hey, Andy, look, now you're not newing it up. Now you're using this dependency to provide this user to you. And you think, wow, you didn't new it up. But guess what? This user converter has to new it up. Something has to new this thing up. It, it can't just come from nowhere, right? So there are certain things that you cannot inject because they can't be determined in advance. They have to be created later, right? Um, you know, these like stateful things that we have that we use around um, has to be created somewhere. You know, like where else would that user come from? I, I can't think of uh, an example. We could talk factory pattern. We could talk about all these different patterns of, of creating things. But somewhere in the code is that word new user. It has to be there somewhere, but nowhere in the code is there new, well, I'll show you where there might be, but new uh, validator, something like that, right? Uh, that, that's what we're aiming for. We're aiming to get rid of that new keyword in those cases. Does that help clarify it a little bit, Chris? Because, you know, I guess there is a gray area here. Um, there's, there's some subtleties and some differences. Um, so I think, I think, for me, what brings it together, and, and again, since we're here in .NET, I'm not sure where you're planning to, are we gonna talk about 
like an IOC container or how you yeah that's where I'm trying yeah, new I'm, one up I'm ready to go there. How yeah you, because that's, that's next yeah the because <laughs> what happens is is you start using you start putting in all your code you start putting in abstractions and then in your classes you expect that the constructor is going to receive the implementations uh, even though they're receiving their interface form you don't care. Right. But this, but somebody's got to new them up. Yeah. And so yeah, no what usually what ends up happening is there's some central place where all this stuff is defined. It's almost like I, I'm trying to think of what to compare it to, like a table of contents or an index, although I don't think that's quite right. It's almost like a a list of who's invited to the party. You, I, you know that you're accepting it's you're accepting one of these. You just don't yeah. know who's invited. I think the word you, you might be looking for, because the, the analogy I use is it's configuration. Somewhere you need to configure, right? You need to set certain values to make the decision. Uh, you could say you're building up a table or something like that or building up a list of configurations. I don't know. That's just the way I look at it. But so let's let's talk about what needs to happen here, okay? So I've got this membership service. Um, and down here in my web application, okay, I've got a controller, okay? And I've used this weather forecast controller. That's like the one you get out of the box. And But ironically, when you get down into here, you see membership service dot join. And I'm just putting in some data in here. So I'm using my membership yeah. service, right? So right. forget about right. everything up here, okay? Like who cares what it does? Doesn't matter. Right, right, right. So what we kid around with is sometimes we use something called poor man's dependency injection, okay? Poor man's dependency injection is that, I, and and you know, I've seen this done plenty of times. Uh, right up at this level, we say um, membership service uh, m uh, m you know equals new membership service. Right? I could do that. Now forget about the squiggly lines. I could do that, and then I could say you know m dot join. Right? The problem here mm -hmm. is that this has dependencies as well, and so then I would have to do this. I'd have to come in here and say I also need a new um, what is membership it? database? Yeah, yeah whatever. Right. All those other validator. Things, yeah, all those other yeah. things that are that are required. But believe me, sometimes people actually do that um, as a sort of cheap way of getting around this. They still get that dependency injection. What they get with that is that ability. There's a couple of reasons you do dependency injection. One of them is testability, right? You want your code to be really testable, and so by newing it up in this way. All my other code is still testable, right? I just create those dependencies myself at, at the highest point where I can, right? But if I don't do this, and if I don't do this, then, whoop, oh my gosh, a lot of control Z's there. Um, if I don't do this, something has to somewhere say, give me a new membership service, okay? So I've bubbled up all the way to the top of my application. I'm in my controller. And again, I have a membership service. And what do I have? I have a constructor a constructor here, public weather forecast controller. And it takes an iMembership service. Okay. So iMembership service, you're going to say, okay, we're doing dependency injection into my controller. Something has to take over somewhere. Well, as Chris was saying earlier, ASP.NET Core has built-in inversion of control. Uh, it's basically called a, an IOC container. And that is the thing that provides this kind of stuff, okay? So what's gonna actually happen here? Let me, let me take you through what needs to happen in this process. It's, it's, I'm talking about ASP.NET, but it's the same thing if we were talking about any other kind of application as, as a whole, like if it was a web forms, I mean a, a Windows app or whatever. Something has to be the top level thing. So when a request comes in to ASP.NET, Okay, what happens when a request comes in? And I'm going to think about like MVC in this example, right? But somewhere along the line, um, the the route, you know, sorry, the uh, the request gets routed to ASP.NET, and it says, "Oh, you're looking for weather forecast slash, you know, get whatever it is, right?" So this thing is going to say, "Oh, uh, MVC says, oh, you've got a weather forecast. That sounds familiar to me. We've got this thing called a weather forecast weather forecast controller." Why don't I new one of these things up for you? Okay, great, thank you. So it news it up for me, right? And then it's gonna call the get method. But when it goes to new it up, it's gonna hit a bit of a snag here. 
it's going to come to this thing and say, well, I can't new it up because there's not a default constructor, right? There's not just a public, you know, this thing, right? This thing doesn't exist. If this exists, by the way, it will cause trouble. If I put that here, it would cause some trouble for me, right? So, so what, what um, ASP.NET MVC uh, a core, I should say, wants to do is it, it, it's going to see that I have this parameter, right? And it's going to say, essentially, hey, I wonder if I could give you one of those things that you need. And it's going to look in its configuration, and we'll show how to do this. It's going to look in that configuration. It's going to say, hey, you know, when Andy wrote this thing, he told me what to do. He told me when I want an I membership service, he wants to use that thing called the membership service, right? That's the one that is actually just this one. Oh, sorry, membership data service. I, I named them wrong a little bit there, but right? I told it. Now, this is not how I told it. Don't be confused by this class. I'll show you where I tell it, but I told it I need that. And so uh, the framework says, okay, let's do it. New membership service. Uh, and then it runs into a snag because it comes down, actually it was this thing here, it was this membership service here. It comes down to this membership service and says, well, wait, 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 I can't create one of those things because this thing has a constructor that takes an iMembership validator. Do I know how to make a membership validator? And it looks in its configuration and it says, yeah, Andy told me how to make one of these things. Okay, so it goes down the stack until it finds nothing else that, that has these, these sort of requirements for the constructor and it news it all up and it shoves it into the things and that's dependent, that's IOC container's job. That's what an IOC container's job is. MVC, uh, ASP.NET Core comes with this built in and so we can see that in action when we look at our startup, okay? When we look at our startup method, we have, this is what it looks, I'm sorry, when we look at our startup class, we see some stuff going on here. And, you know, we have configure and we have configure services. Now, take a step, a breather here. This is ASP.NET uh, Core. There are other ways to do this in other frameworks and other paradigms. This is the way you do it in ASP.NET Core. But the concept is going to really be the same. So there's this thing called configure services. This is a required thing that's part of, you know, ASP.NET is expecting this to be here. And we can already see a little bit of something being configured. We're saying, hey, services, add controllers. Okay, let's add controllers. But then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say services.add. I'm going to use this method called add transient. There's a couple of choices I have. We'll come back to that. And I'm going to say, when you see the need for a membership service, please use the membership service. When you see a need for the I membership service, please use membership service. Okay, I'm configuring this thing and of course I can add my uh, my um, my usings and stuff like that, right? I've just gave it the instructions on what I want it to do. Simple as that. Now, if I do this, it's going to hit a snag because it knows how to create this I membership service, but it's going to run into a, I mean, it knows what to use, but it's going to run into a snag with the others. And so what I'd really do, and I'm, I'll make life easy for myself right here, um, is we would come up in here and we would put whoop, these things in there. Okay. And now this, and there's more than one way to do this, but this is a way to sort of set up my definitions. Um, sorry. Um, does that, you know, and, and we're going to take this a little further, but hopefully that gets us to that like root of where do these things come from? Someone needs to do the dirty work, right? And in this case, um, that's, that's what's happening in this case. We're yeah. adding MVC and this is what's called an IOC container. I don't know why it's called a container. I think the container is that we stick all these things in the container and then they're there ready for us when we need them later or something. But IOC, oh, one last thing. We talked about what is dependency injection. We're injecting our dependency. IOC is inversion of control. And what that means is that this membership service needs an I membership validator, but it's not in control. 
it doesn't get to decide which membership validator it gets, okay? We're inverting the control to the application, to a higher level, sorry, to a higher level that says, this whole application is gonna make the decisions that we're gonna use later. We're inverting who's in charge of fulfilling the, the dependency. Yeah, and so in the example that you showed us, the 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 mapping if you will and if i shouldn't use that term i think it's a good term mapping yep okay that that informs you know the this application it's it's in configure services and so before you wonder like well what's calling configure services we're using a framework asp.net core is a framework and these these methods are provided to us and we're told that if we if we start filling up this i services i service collection container if we start building it up with mapping to say that when you want an iMembership service, go new up a membership service. When you want an iMembership validator, go new up a membership validator. We could change it to other concrete implementations just by changing the right side of those mappings. Yeah. I can but put the second the thing foo, you're doing... The foo membership service, if that's what I want to do, right? Right, right. And what's relevant to a web developer in the ASP.NET space is because ASP.NET operates multi-threaded, the web server is multi-threaded, we needed that additional ability to say, should you new up a new one every single time? That's what add transient is basically saying. Mm -hmm. Or you could add a different scope to say, no, we just need one of them forever and keep using it over and over and over, which sometimes you do want. Mm -hmm. um, Very much so. But that's not that's not dependency inversion. That's that. So I just don't want people to get confused when they see add scoped, add transient, add singleton. Is that part of dependency inversion? I think my answer is no. That's more of a ASP.NET specific thing to help us developers say, not only do I want you to supply these services, I want you to supply them in a certain way because we're in a multi-threaded server. That's just that's a world we live in in ASP.NET. Our server is multi-threaded. You know, if you um, were in if yeah, you were I in think, JavaScript, yeah, you, it wouldn't it wouldn't quite necessarily mean the same thing. I mean, I suppose you could still want a new one every time for every request. You could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these but, concepts uh, are are sort of universal. Like we're going to talk about other inversion of control containers that we can use. Yeah, uh, and they all have this sort of concept of multiple different scopes, right? Add scoped, add singleton, add transient. They all have that. And I think that um, that would mean different things. Like you say, it, you know, if ASP.NET wasn't multi-threaded, you know, some of this stuff becomes a little, a little different. But uh, from what I understand, the Java frameworks, the, um, you know, the other yep. IOC containers for other languages do support something very different, that, similar. They might call it different words. I don't know what word they use, you know, but yeah. I think that's a concept. So to me, that's a, like you said, that is not part of dependency injection. To me, that's a feature of how I configure my IOC container, right? It's just a right. feature. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, but what's cool, what's nice about it is that ASP.NET, you know, has this feature built in. It has this uh, configurability built in. But I wanted to show that we can swap that out pretty easily and use a totally different model, um, which I think is actually a better model. I think it's actually, you know, um, is even even easier to use, right? Um, and it'll just take a minute, unless we have questions here on on any of this kind of stuff. You know, I, I can hold off and then we can I can do a quick demo of showing how to use. Um, and and when I what I want to preface by saying, why would I use a different IOC container? So ASP.NET has this IOC stuff built in, right? But it's built in to be pluggable, right? They built it that way on purpose. They said, we know people are going to want to use other IOC libraries, right? Other frameworks to do this kind of stuff. Other frameworks may have more features. To be fair, the MVC, uh, sorry, the ASP.NET Core one out of the box is pretty low, um, low frills. It does what it needs to do, but it doesn't have a lot of the fancy bells and whistles that you would get with, uh, with another library. Um, so uh, you up for seeing that? 
Yeah, sure. That's a loaded question, right? Yep, for seeing that. Because I, you know, and, and while you're sitting up there, I remember in the .NET Framework world, there was like the Unity container. There sure is. And and it even had the ability to do this configuration in a file. Wait, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, wait, don't give away any of my little uh, surprises. Oh, I'm not trying to. <laughs> I, I figured if you had to go to another screen, I would I would talk for a little bit while you were getting ready. But if you don't. Uh, no, I don't need another screen here. I can do it right here. <laughs> it's, it's easy. Yeah, I'm right? curious. I'm yeah. curious because I know I haven't seen I haven't really looked into doing anything other than just then adding services to the service collection and then calling it a day and moving on with my life. So, yeah, I just I, I was going to say I don't need another thing, but I just realized I, I closed my snippet by mistake. So I'm going to open that up. So there's a bunch of libraries you can use to do this kind of stuff. Uh, you mentioned Unity. There's one called Ninject. There's, I remember Ninja. You remember Ninja, yeah. right? Still pretty popular, yeah. actually. Uh, one of the really popular ones that I used for many years is called Structure Map. Now, okay, I remember. St structure yeah. Map, for those people that are Structure Map fans, Structure Map's actually not um, supported anymore. So structure Map works great, and quite frankly, if you're still using it, it works fine. You don't necessarily need a whole lot of support with something, but they're not adding new features to it, right? They're not taking it to the .NET Core uh, side of things. And so the makers of that, and I think they had some things that they weren't thrilled about when they made it, as, as we do typically when we make software. So they, they wanted to start fresh, I think. And um, they created something called uh, Lamar. And Lamar is the one I like to use. Lamar, if you're already using Structure Map and you want to like copy your code over or whatever and switch to Lamar, the code looks exactly the same. I mean, I guess the namespaces are different. But the configuration part of it, it's like the s syntax is, um, is you know, they carry the, the syntax forward. So it works like a nice, easy swap. So how would I do that? Well, I could, and I'll show you why, by the way, because, you know, why would I want to go away from this? This works great. Uh, let's just start off by going into here and adding um, a NuGet package. Oh, you know what? I should probably like build everything. I don't know. I'll get into trouble with that before I start adding stuff. So let's go in here and say I want to add Lamar. Lamar has two packages that should come up to the top here. There's the basic Lamar stuff, and this is the Lamar that is ready to use for ASP.NET Core, right? Built in with the features for, for that. So I'm going to add this and install that and say yes to all these things. I accept. Hey, you know that window that popped up here, Chris and Rich? I'm curious. There's that one window that says, don't show this again. That one that gives me like the list of all the stuff that's going in. There's a checkbox up here. It went kind of fast. It says, don't show this again. Do you guys check that? Like, or do you always leave it like every time and see that kind of stuff? And do you even huh. know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I do, but it depends on the checkbox sometimes. And I, yeah. I'm i trying to think if I, I probably... I probably don't check that one, but I, I'm not going to tell you I have a good reason. It just strikes me as one of those things that for some reason I don't check it. And so every time I add a NuGet package, I have to click like, okay there. And I'm always like, am I reading this carefully? Like, I, I'm just curious to know what you guys do. You know, it seems like an extra step that I haven't gotten away from yet, but <laughs> I digress. So I want to use Lamar. I now go into my program. Uh which is where my application starts. And I go in here and I say dot use Lamar. Okay. And when I do that, I should get my little help here. Use Lamar dependency injection. And so now it's it's wiring up Lamar, right? And, and I, I guess somehow in doing that, it unwires the ASP.NET, you know, the built-in stuff. I'm, I'm not really familiar with what happens under the under the covers, but this just swaps it over. So now I'm using Lamar. Uh, maybe actually they both run. I, I don't know. No, I don't think they can both run together. So I don't know, but it must do that. Okay, now I've got this configure services. Lamar takes a slightly different approach to things. I don't know why, but Lamar wants me to use this method called bring it over here my code snippet um, configure container instead of configure services for the life of me I, I don't understand there's a subtle difference um, and that's what you use 
The interesting thing is this goes away. Like I don't need this at all, okay? Don't need it at all. So what I'll do now in here is um, I still need a couple things in here. So I'm gonna put this in here. Um, let's see, you know, like this kind of stuff. Like I can still have all these things in here, okay? And um, so now I, you could think, all right, I guess what I got to do is come in here and say services dot add transient. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's just be lazy and I'm just going to copy this up into here. Okay. And isn't that great? I am back exactly where I started. Like this didn't solve any problem for me. You might be wondering, but sometimes you need to do this, right? Sometimes you need to tell it exactly what you need. The feature I like best, is this. I'm going to copy this in here. Okay. Um, okay. Services.scan. Okay. And it's going to say, what do I scan? Scan the calling assembly. That means scan this web application, right? And, whoop, sorry. Um, and use default conventions. What are default conventions? Default conventions is this, okay? I'm just taking this thing and I'm sticking an I in front of it, right? Most of the time, all I do is stick an I in front of it, right? So if I do this, and let me tell you, I have applications that would have 50, 50 lines of this stuff, right? Every time I add something new, I gotta come in here and configure it. No, not with the scan feature. The scan feature does all this automatically. Now, Sometimes I might need to scan and then come in here and say, you know what? I want to override that because I want to use the foo, the foo membership service, right? I can still do that. I don't have to take these default conventions. I can override things if I want. But isn't this cool that you can get this like instant, instant um, wiring up of everything? Um, there's one exception to this, technically. I, there's one more step I need to do, which is the fact that my dependencies are in... Oh, you know, this kills me. With, with core, I, I click on these things a lot. And every time I click on this, I'm, I'm clicking it to highlight it. I don't know if you guys do this. And it opens the, the proj file for me. Um, it's just this, this habit I have. I, do you guys find that happening to you guys all is the time? Is that a double click or just no, a single click? I'm just tapping that. it, right? And it... Huh, I, and didn't, it, I didn't know that. It's like, ah, oh, it's making me crazy, right? Um, anyway, the point is, I can't just do the calling assembly. I have to say um, assembly, and I can say, uh, we're name, right? I can just say uh, dependency conversion dot uh, interfaces, right? I have, to, I have to tell it like where to look, right? But this is a lot easier than, um, let's just say, uh, implement, in, implementations. Uh, this is still easier. You do this like once or twice. But I'm telling you, in my applications, I have to add, you know, 50 of these. And I have to do it all the time. And I always forget. And it causes trouble. So this is a really great feature. There's a reason why we might want to go out to an additional framework like Lamar or one of its competitors, and they're really all pretty good. <laughs> Who's laughing? Yeah, so what's interesting here is you could, theoretically, and I, I was looking at the Lamar docs while you were talking. Oh yeah, we could bring that up if you because want. Because there's a lot more power than just what you're showing, yeah. but theoretically you could get to a place where, to your point that the IOC in ASP.NET Core is, is, is kind of the minimum that you, that you need, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could get to a place here where you could ship your code and then, but still have the ability to add new abstractions because you've, you you're kind of configured to look for that. I'm not trying to say I know how you would do it, but it, when I'm looking through their examples, really, it sounds like you're saying compile it, ship it, but add like, you know, with a file and maybe next to my exe or something like that, like configure things there. That'd be cool. Well, it looks like you can build. You can build up objects like with a Lambda function that you give it. So now theoretically that opens the world, right? What do you want the Lambda function to do? Maybe it goes and reads a file. I don't know. You can do all kinds of things. 
You can do, uh, and this some stuff you can do down here as well. I could say, um, for whatever reason, um, I can say, for whatever reason, I'm in the wrong spot here, that I could do services dot, um, I don't know, add transient, doesn't really matter. And I could say, uh, for um, I membership validator, membership data service, fine, doesn't really matter, right? In this case, when I do that, I want to use this specific thing. And I, and I know we said not to use the new keyword, but maybe I really need to new it up here. Uh, and I'm going to say use new foo uh, membership uh, service because in here I want to say, uh, you know, some configuration thing, you know, true or false yeah. or whatever it is. You know, you can build out yeah. these things like any way you want. Like, you know, there's a lot you can do with this stuff. It, it could even allow you to use some some abstractions or some concretions that maybe weren't designed well enough for your typical IOC scenario. Yeah. You write a little bit of code and you've kind of you built the bridge to make it work and and but this is the place to new things up, right? I mean, this is our configuration spot like you were saying earlier there's a place because i've seen so i've seen this isn't i don't want to call it dependency injection but but let's pick another language right um you talked a little bit about method injection well if you're in a language like f sharp a functional language you are going to to directly pass uh functions into other functions a function is going to be like an orchestrator and you're going to say well this function tells you where to get the members this tells this function tells you how to validate the members, and then this is the function where I want you to give the list of validated members to, and the orchestrating function goes, I don't know, just I'll just run these things. But how do you glue it together? Well, there's typically there's typically at the beginning of the code base at the top level there's this resolution that says, all right, here's where all here's where all those functions are. It's the same thing. It's just not, you know, here we are an object oriented. Uh, mm -hmm. dependency inversion. Yeah. This is, you know, functional. Sure. Um, it's interesting because I was thinking a little bit about JavaScript as we were doing this. And we're not talking TypeScript here. But, you know, I, I was looking around before the show and I was thinking, does, would, would, this, would this, this principle even apply in a language that doesn't necessarily have the strong typing of of a uh, of like C sharp or JavaScript, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it so, does. I, I've used it's not. If they don't call it dependency injection. Uh, well, dependency inversion. Yeah. Well, right, right, right. They don't call it. That. But if you want to see, I have a blog post that you, I can bring up on my screen. Oh yeah, you want me to share? Uh, yeah. Let me switch to your screen. So you have to share. Yeah. Um, let me know when you're sharing. Are you? Uh, yeah, I'm sharing. Sure. You are. Oh, okay. I'm not seeing it here. Um, let's go to this and see. Yeah. Okay. Should be seeing your screen now. Okay. So the reason I wanted, and again, I'll bet you we can find other, other blog posts. But I specifically went looking decoupling code in JavaScript with the dependency inversion principle, and I said, "Great, awesome, exactly what we're talking about tonight." And this, I felt this example was simple enough that it's probably pretty easy to go through, but look, just like our show tonight, there was an introduction and a reminder of what the solid principles are, That's fantastic. Cool. And then uh, the example said, well, what if we were using the fetch API in JavaScript and we had a method, um, you know, and we had a method and we just use fetch directly. Well, we don't have interfaces. So, you know, I guess it's the only thing you can do because we don't have interfaces in JavaScript. I guess you just have to, to do that. And what this person was saying is, well, wait a second. What if, what if uh, instead of fetch, there was a different implementation that might use the the old-fashioned XML HTTP request, or or maybe this library Axios, right? Well, I mean, you know, you're stuck because our language doesn't support it. Well, and what this person is saying is, no, no, no. You could, you could write a utils JS, where you basically export a method called do get, and granted, the method name isn't important. But you export this method that takes a URL and uses fetch as its method. You could also write it again 
except this time using XML HTTP requests and the next time using the Axios library. But each time you export the do get method that takes a <laughs> URL. So in a way you've kind of, I mean, that's kind of like an interface. I know it's not strongly typed. I know it doesn't have all the advantages of, of C Sharp and, and Java enforcing that interface. But when you go back to your, to your consuming code, you import the method and you use it and you don't know what it's doing. All you know is that it returns a promise. Mm -hmm. And when that promise is done, you can read the results. You, you stop caring about what happens underneath, which means that you can switch your implementation later just by changing the utils.js file here in this case. This is the example. I'm going to use this other library now. Right. And I thought, hey, that's great. That's great. You, you've, you've now basically encapsulated this code in an external file and you've you've implemented dependency inversion you've just done it in javascript i thought pretty cool I, I even found a ruby example and i'm not a ruby developer but in the ruby example again they said hey us another another blog going through the solid principles so once again <laughs> that's awesome i love that i bet you we could read the rest of this series and implement and, and learn about all of the solid principles in Ruby. He used the same definition you did earlier and then discussed the hexagonal architecture, which you may be familiar with, saying here like, well, you know, these higher level abstractions in in-memory database, a Mongo database implementation, a PostgreSQL implementation, they all, they all need, they all implement a data source, which then implements a repository. So he's like, we could, we could implement a user repository that just takes the user in and implements these functions. But now the problem is I'm stuck with this user, which in this case happens to be an active record. Remember active record? No. That used to be a common implementation. It's pretty common in Ruby, the active record pattern. Well, this user repository is stuck with it now. That means if you ever want to test this code or use this code, you got to have the database. You got to have the MySQL database. You can't even write a unit test without the MySQL database. So by inverting the dependency using the dependency inversion principle, he says, no, no, no. We should initialize the user repository with a data source to be named later and then write the methods against that data source that I don't even know yet. That way later on, I could implement an in-memory version and I could use the in-memory version in my unit tests and never instantiate the database. So what I loved about this post here, since Active Record was such is such a key important part of Rails, you know, and Meg is saying that there, and I didn't know that. I didn't know that before I read this blog post. He says it a little bit later. Believe me, I learned a lot about Ruby just reading this blog post. But I wanted to look, I said, you know, a lot of times on our show we work in C sharp, we work in .NET. But I was convinced these are these are important universal principles that I'm sure I can find examples for in other popular languages or other popular languages that aren't necessarily strongly typed. So we'll include these in our in our uh, show notes in the, the link that I like to give out that expands into all the, the links. But um, I just wanted to take that quick detour because I felt like I don't want anyone to walk away thinking like, Man, that's great, Andy. I, I don't use C sharp. I don't use and I and I know C sharp and Java are similar, but I don't use that either. So I guess I'll I, I guess I'll unsubscribe and click uh click unlike click unlike on this video. <laughs> Speaking of which, if you are watching this show on YouTube, maybe now or or you're watching in the future, uh, definitely let us know what you think by reacting in the comments. Do you have other blog posts you like to look at? Other other are there other uh, languages where you are using the dependency inversion principle or even better did you watch the show tonight and say i i'm actually using that principle and didn't realize that it had a name and that it was so eloquently described by somebody like a mr andy schwamm well let us know down in the comments hit the like button so that we know to make more episodes just like this one and hit the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new videos go up but i definitely want to thank um, eloquent you know Everybody that's watching on on Twitch as well, we had a good viewership here tonight. Thanks to Meg for for asking questions and for um, for letting us know. Like she says right there, you know, Active Record is built right into Rails, and uh, and and I hope this is handy for everybody watching in chat live as well. 
it's not just C sharp that this is useful for, you know, think about abstracting, think about writing abstractions you can depend on so that you're not stuck with the details, right? All right. So Rich, what do you think? <laughs> Look, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say something. I I was commenting all night in the chat, so that was kind yeah. of where the all right, all right. <laughs> Rich is taking care of chat for us there and supplying, you know, uh, Monty Python reference and and that's Christmas good. story. Yeah, Christmas. Yeah, right. You know, the chat's an important part of this. Let's just be clear yeah, about that. It is. We There's a lot going love on in the chat. People chatting and engaging with us. And we take turns on like who do different things on the show, right? Today, Rich is like highly engaged in the chat. It's great. Um, you know, today I'm I'm doing the I'm actually running the stream thing out of my house and praying to God that it goes well. Uh, you know, we do, we do different things, but yeah, the chat is like the chat's the key. Well, it's been great, and Andy, once again, we all know that it's there. There's there's time, effort, expertise put into something like this. A little bit more, you almost felt a little presentation style. And then, and you know, you never know which style of show you'll get on the Dev Talk show. So I think we all thank you very much for putting in the, the time tonight to, to get us this far. This is great. Thanks. I hope I that, learned uh, about Lamar. Yeah, Lamar's I'm excited. Lamar's pretty good. Uh, there's others, though. You know, there's other, op op other well, options there. Um, you know, with well, it like being it. built in, I never thought about even looking anywhere. And and here we go, you know, you successor know, to structure map. One of the I will say this: it's interesting because we talk about like you know why go elsewhere. I remember in the early early days of of core, you know, where they would talk about how we're building in we're building in these things, but again we're do, we're doing it loosely coupled, like we're we're going to allow you to use your own. Like they always talked about it so much that it seemed like it would be important. They said, we're just gonna give you a basic one. Um, you know, they're built around uh, extensibility, like frameworks like that. So we're not like cheating on, oh my gosh, you're going away from the ASP.NET team. They built it so that we could use other things. You know, um, and I remember them talking about it so much. No, you can add your own, you can add your own. And I thought, why do I wanna add my own? <laughs> I can use the one that's built in. And here I am. Using my, not my own, but, you know, using my own choice. I was kind of looking for this blog post, too. I, I actually think there was a .NET Rocks episode. I wonder if they even had one of these gentlemen on. I don't remember for sure now. Stephen where they, Peter. uh... Who are Stephen and Peter? They, Do we have full names on them? Um, so, I, 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 this is the Simple Injector blog. Huh. Must be um, the guys that write the blog, Stephen and Peter. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm sorry that I don't know more about them here, but they had, and this is 2016. They had a post. You know, here it is. What's wrong? And then how they worked around. And again, I want to be fair. I haven't read this, but I do think. I think I will include it in the list, and and then maybe I will read it. And and uh, who knows? Um, boy, for some Having reason, it won't let me draw. Own. Oh. I, I know why it's not letting me drop it in. Yeah. Are you over silly, your Silly, silly. No, it's, yeah, you know, there's a tab limit now. Didn't, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there's no tab limit. Um, that would be a disaster. Uh, the reason was is because I was using profiles and you can't tear a tab from one profile and move it to a, another profile. Yeah. I didn't this know is that, the but that makes, that makes perfect sense. It that makes, makes total sense. sense. Yeah. 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 Did not this know is that. just, I mean, because this isn't a secret or anything. This is Edge running as the Dev Talk Show, and this is Edge running as me. And when you get to be like us, you know, you end up having multiple accounts in different places, and so embedding them in profiles makes it easier. I don't have to like log out and log in and log out and log in. But and so I'm sitting here going like, why can't I inject? And Andy yeah. even you finally called it out. Like, what's wrong with it? I was him? like laughing. I'm like, what are you doing? I know. He's like, gosh, <laughs> so much for being a career Windows user. You can't yeah, even use a mouse. Yeah. What's wrong with this? You need guy? a command line to move that from one. Uh, so that's actually I a good should've. tip, though, that I didn't know that because I could see myself banging my head against the wall for a half hour going, why can't I move this? So I just yeah, learned something I, like that's one of those little things that you, you always learn something and you just never know you what wanna, it's going to be. 
you know, let, I'm not sure if I'll get this right, but do you want to learn something else? So, yeah. Have you? So I, let me. I don't know if this applies to everybody. Um, you've all seen me do this, right? The uh, oh, well, of course I can't even do it. So maybe not. Maybe you all haven't seen it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I thought it was control. Oh, you know, it's because I don't have a second desktop. Have you all seen my talk about how you switch virtual desktops really quickly? Have you ever lost a window to another to the other to the other monitor and you can't like you just you've lost it. A lot of yeah. times it's an electron window, right? Yeah. yeah. And you're Definitely. like I don't know what to do. I can't so I got I had tricks that I would use. Um for the longest time I would use a trick like this where uh, I, I got to figure out how to even demonstrate it here you where I would, right? yeah. um, yeah, it's hard to lose in this situation. Um, you have to push it down the where, bottom, I think is what you can do. Right. Yeah. And then I would come here and I would pick like, I would pick like move. Yeah. But you don't always have and, move anymore. I, I right? know. So especially with an electron app. So it turns out, turns out shortcut that I discovered recently, alt shift and then left and right. And I got to have this, uh, I'm sorry, not alt shift, window shift left and right. And I am moving this window from a monitor that you can see to a monitor you can't see. Yeah, baby. Yeah. And uh, the reason why that's become important for me is because this center monitor gets shared between my work machine and my home machine. But I don't feel like unplugging the cables. So both machines believe that the monitor is active. So the right now my work laptop it thinks it has this monitor. But what if I've got a window up on there and and I and so I can I can walk over to this machine and I can I can window shift left and move it over. Maybe it'll help you someday, maybe it won't. So it's always good to hear the tips. I, I you know don't you remember when back in the days when we were allowed to leave the house and we yeah. would go to like, you know, a Philly.net meeting or something like that. And people would go through these like, you know, 100 tips in, in you know, in an hour or something like that or, you know, whatever it was. And some of them would be like these little helpful things. And you were like, yeah, that's awesome. You know, let's and you were just writing them down as fast as you could go. You know, uh, I love that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's it for me. Um, as far as you know, what I was going to show there, and and uh, is there anything else you wanted to wrap up on? I don't want to, you know, if there's something else that we're missing. I learned a lot about dependency injection and about uh, about dependency inversion and about dependency injection <laughs> in ASP.NET Core. <laughs> well, we 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 kind of combined ended up combining the topics, sort of, right? Well, they they really work hand in hand together. Um, you know, they, they build upon each other. You need the dependency inversion principle sets the stage. Dependency injection is how you solve it. And dependency injection is made possible by IOC, right? You know, like they just, they work together. You know. Yeah. Let us know what you think about the format, about being on YouTube and Twitch. Any comments at all, reach, us, reach out to us on Twitter and chat or on YouTube comments. But I think we're just about done. Thanks again, Andy. For the, for the work tonight and thanks rich and uh both of you make it so much easier so thanks you in the chat you make it easy to be here we will see you december 2nd at 8 30 u.s eastern time please have a safe thanksgiving if you're here in the u.s or anywhere in the world doesn't matter what's going on next week have a good and safe week and we will see you next time on the dev talk show